Multivariable Calculus, Section 14.5, Surface Integrals. Let's review line integrals. Back in single variable calculus, we actually integrated along a line, namely the x-axis. And then, recently, we learned about line integrals where we integrated along a more general curve in three dimensions. Back in single variable calculus, the integral was integrate f of x from a to b dx, and the line integral was integrate along c, f of x, y, z, ds. dx was the infinitesimal change along the x-axis. ds is the infinitesimal change along the curve. However, the line integral is a single integral, and a single integral has to be in terms of a single variable before we can compute it. So what did we do? Well, we parameterized. We assigned a function of t to each point on the curve. In other words, x is a function of t, y had to be written as a function of t, and z had to be written as a function of t. That way, we could change our line integral into an integral in terms of t, and then it becomes just like a regular single variable integral. Notice that ds, the, change, the instantaneous change along the curve, became the square root of the sum of the squares of the derivatives times dt, where dt is the infinitesimal change in the parameter t. So there is what ds became. And then we just replaced x, y, and z in the integrand, in the rest of the integrand, uh, with their equivalents in terms of t. So how do we parameterize the surface? Well, we need two variables, u and v, and we need to create functions for each of the coordinates x, y, and z in terms of u and v. Here's a vector in standard notation, a standard position, and that vector is r of u, v equaling the three components for x, y, and z in terms of u and v. Now before we completely do um, the surface area integral, let's quickly review the Jacobians from 13.9 because this is going to be a similar type of thing. Recall that for um, in 13.9 we dealt with curvy flat areas on the xy plane and we needed to rewrite them in terms of uh, easier to integrate over uh, regions that were simple and not curvy and not simple in the uv plane. And we approximated the curvy regions in the xy plane by summing areas of parallelograms determined by the velocity vectors along the u and v curves. As the changes in u and v shrank to the instantaneous changes in u and v, the change in area became the instantaneous change in area and thus was equivalent. And how did we find those areas? Well, the area of a parallelogram is the determinant, and because this was all flat 2D surfaces, um, the k components were zero, and therefore only two of the uh, diagonals were non-zero. And then uh, this vector is perpendicular to each parallelogram, and its length is the area of the parallelogram. And the length, then, is just the absolute value of that quantity there. And we had other notations, um, because it turns out that we could just use the 2 by 2 determinant and to do the, um, to make the Jacobian. And then we had this notation also for the Jacobian. So then what we did was we took, if we wanted the area of the curvy region, we could have a double integral integrating 1 with the change in area dx dy, and that was equivalent to using the region in the uv plane, integrating over the region in the uv plane that was not curvy, that was nice and simple, um, if we used 1 times the Jacobian du dv. Now likewise, if we had a function, uh, that we were integrating over that area rather than just finding the area, then our function wasn't 1, our integrand wasn't just 1, it was f of x, y, and we changed the function by rewriting x and y in terms of u and v uh, using whatever equation we came up with or were given in the problem, and then times the Jacobian du dv.
Now, this change of variables went from two variables to two variables, ostensibly to create an easier integral or an easier region. And, but now we need to go from three variables to two variables because evaluating a double integral with three variables is impossible. You have to change it into two variables. So it's similar, a little bit different. And so what we're going to do is we're going to change our function in x, y, and z into a function in uh, three functions, one for x, one for y, and one for z, each in terms of u and v. And then ds is going to have to be some kind of Jacobian-ish thing times du dv. So this is the part we still have to figure out. So how are we going to parameterize the surface? Well, here's a generic point on the surface, x, y, z. And we have two velocity vectors times the, the velocity in the u direction with respect uh, to the change in u and the velocity vector in, in uh, the v direction times uh, change in v. And then the area of that parallelogram will approximate uh, areas on the curvy surface. And if we cross those two vectors, we get a vector perpendicular to the parallelogram that whose length is equal to the area of the parallelogram. So that change in s, which is the area of the parallelogram, equals this cross product, or the length of the cross product. Uh, we're using the vectors. Um, and then we're using tiny scalars to multiply those, those little changes in u and v. And so we can just uh, factor those out. And so what we're going to do here is let the change in u and change in v go to instantaneous changes. And so ds is just going to be uh, the length of this uh, cross product times du dv. But we're going to need an easier integral because uh, doing cross products isn't much fun. So let's explore that next. Notice that the um, vector, the partial derivative of r with respect to u can be written this way. And the partial derivative of r with respect to v can be written this way. So then the cross product is this determinant. And rather than show all the steps, here's what it comes out to. And um, notice that the last component is our friend from section 13.9. And the middle component times j is a similar one, but it's um, partial of x and c with respect to u and v. And then the i component, the, uh, the number in front of the i component, is the partial of y and z with respect to u and v. So we have three expressions rather than just one. So, so now what we need is the uh, length of this vector. And so we're going to square each of these partial derivatives um, and add them together under the square root. So here's where we are so far. Now, of course, if the integrand is not just a 1, then we have to replace x, y, and z in the function with their equivalents in terms of u and v. So now we have this lovely integral. Still looks complicated, but an easier integral is on its way. Do not worry. Useful form for surface integrals. Here's what we have so far. However, in most cases, the surface S can be described by z equal h of x and y. So what we're going to do is we're going to let x and y be our parameters. Isn't that clever? So now we have f of x, y, and h of x, y. So we only have to replace z with its um, equivalent in x and y. And we'll have that. We'll have that equation. And then we replace u and v in each of those um, derivatives under the square root with x and y. So now what do we got? Well, let's take a look at that last one. The determinant that goes with that is x, 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 y. And then the second row is y, x, y, y. 
But the derivative of x with respect to x is 1, and the derivative of y with respect to y is 1. The derivative of x with respect to y is 0, and the derivative of y with respect to x is also 0. So that just equals 1. Isn't that nice? Now, meanwhile, the first one, we have yx, yy in the first row, and zx, zy in the second row. Derivative of y with respect to x again is 0, and that's times zy. Then the second diagonal, the derivative of y with respect to y is 1, and that's times zx. So that comes out to negative zx. So we're going to have negative zx squared, and we can actually drop the negative when we fill that in. And then finally, the middle one is zx, zy in the first row, and xx, xy in the second row. So we have zx times 0, because the derivative of x with respect to y is 0. And then we have minus um, xx, the derivative of x with respect to x is 1, times zy, and that comes out to negative zy. So those are, those should look familiar, because those are the components of the gradient. Hey, hey, so that's actually what we're ending up with here. Cool. So now we have a nicer integral, replacing um, our derivatives this way, because uh, zx is just the derivative of h with respect to x, because we're defining z as a function h of x and y. And we can drop the negative because we're squaring it. And then negative zy squared is the same as the partial of h with respect to y squared. And then the 1 I just put in the front. Now, notice that we've changed where we're integrating also because we're changing to the uv plane. And in this case, it's the xy plane. So we're just integrating over the shadow of s on the xy plane. Cool. Now, of course, if a uh, function of x, y, and z equals 1, remember, then the surface interval will return the surface area. So here's uh, what ds equals. Instantaneous change on a surface, ds. And here I'm using z instead of h. They're interchangeable. Not to be confused with change along a curve, d small s, which is the sum of the three derivatives squared with respect to t. So ds, capital S, is along a surface. ds, small s, is along curve, and they are different. And uh, it's, some students get those confused. Notice that we have dx, dy, two variables, because we're param parameterizing by two independent variables, whereas down here, we're parameterizing by only one independent variable. So that's the difference in those two. Now, to review for center of mass now, if a surface S is made of a thin material with density, uh, this density function, at each point x, y, and z, then the mass of the material is given by the surface integral integrating the density function along the surface. And the center of mass, what your text calls a centroid, is given by these three equations, which should look somewhat familiar. You divide by the mass and uh, for the x-coordinate of the centroid or center of mass, you multiply by x, and for y, you multiply by y, and for z, you multiply by z. And so um, the formulas are fairly simple, but I can't guarantee that the uh, integrals will always be easy. Now we're going to review a vector fields and line integrals here for a second. The work done by vector function f, pqr along curve c, is given by the line integral f dot dr or f dot tds. And then we had um, a couple of ways to rewrite that. Notice that dr is um, the vector dx, dy, dz. And then we had flux, the flow of a thin layer of liquid in, in a 2D ve vector field, where f was um, density times velocity vector. 
and the equation for that, the vector for that was a line integral, flux, that funny symbol is flux, is the line integral f dot n ds, and then the uh, computational form for that was uh, the uh, partial of n with respect to x plus the partial of n with respect to y. And that was thanks to Green's theorem. It was a, an offshoot of Green's theorem. So now let's look at surface integral in vector fields. Flux in 2D measures the flow of a thin layer of fluid across a curve. And here's what we used for that. Similarly, flux in 3D measures the flow of a fluid through a surface. Something like that. And here we have f is pqr. And the flux then is the double integral of f dot n ds. Notice capital S, not small s. But don't worry, an easy form of this integral also exists. Here's the integral used for flux computations. Okay, so what are we going to do about that? Well, again, in most cases, the surface s can be described by z equal h of x, y. And so what we end up with is this integral, negative p partial of z with respect to x minus q times partial of z with respect to y plus r dx dy integrated over the shadow d of the surface s. Okay, so um, I haven't explained why, why this is yet, but don't worry, it's coming. Here's a picture of it. Derivations on the next slide. Are you ready? So you may want to write that down, because that's what you're going to use. OK, here we go. Let's review the gradient. Recall that the gradient is fx, fy. It's a 2D vector perpendicular to the level surfaces of s, or level curves of s, rather, because we're in 2D. So. Here's a picture of that gradient with only two, two uh, components. It's uh, perpendicular to the curve, but it's parallel to the xy plane. Now, if we take z equal f of xy and subtract, we get 0 equals z minus f of xy. Then we can regard s as a level surface of g of xyz, a four-dimensional function, z minus f of xy. And therefore, the three-dimensional gradient vector, negative fx comma negative fy comma 1, is perpendicular to s the same way the two-dimensional gradient was perpendicular to the level curve. And so it looks like this. And so in order to have a vector perpendicular to the surface, this is what we need. So there it is again. It has the following length. Gee, that looks familiar. And so the normal, the, the unit normal vector is just that vector divided by its length. Now remember ds, hmm, that looks familiar, was the same thing. So when we take f dot n ds, we get the vector pqr times n, which is the unit vector, the gradient divided by its length. And then we have ds, which is the same as the length of the gradient. So that cancels. Pretty cool, huh? And so then when we dot those two vectors together, ta-da, we get what we said we were going to get. So as long as we parameterize with x and y, this integral has done all the simplification for us. Cool beans. So this is what we're going to use. Now, note this is actually only valid if we're measuring flow upward through the surface S. Because remember, the drawing I had, it was, well, you've got 1 for, this, for the Z component, and it was going upwards. That was our N, so it's poking upwards. And there was our unit vector in the direction of N. Now, to compute flow downwards, well, all you got to do is just take the vector going the other way. So you just reverse the signs. And then you're going to have this integral. OK? All right, let's move on. Summary of key formulas. 
Here's what we're using for our surface integral where we're integrating some function over a surface. And there's what ds looks like. And here's a picture of what we're doing. d is the shadow of the surface on the xy plane. And f of xy, h of xy, or f of xyz, is what we're integrating as our integrand. So they're little, I think you can think of them as little heights at every point on the surface. Continuing, here's the key formula for flux. Here's some pictures showing what flux is all about. Two different integrals here, you know. Related, but different. Okay, so now we're going to look at an example. Number two, evaluate the surface integral, given that the function is x times y times z, and s is a triangle with these three vertices. Well, let's take a look at a sketch of that. There's s. s is a plane. And here's our formula that we need to fill in. So what do we need to do first? Well, we need an equation for s in order to solve for z equals um, h of x comma y. How do we do that? Well, to get the equation of a plane, we need to cross two vectors in the plane to get the normal to the plane. So there's one vector that goes from, three zero, uh, from uh, 0, 2, 0 to 3, 0, 0. So if we subtract, we get that vector. And then here's another one that goes from 0, 2, 0 to 0, 0, 6. And if we subtract those, uh, then we get this vector. So then we cross those two, and I didn't show the work, but uh, you know how to make a determinant and figure that out. And so then we dot that with a generic vector in the plane, and I used the first point, x minus 3, y minus 0, z minus 0. And when we dot those two together, we get um, a nice equation for the plane, which I then solved for z. So that's our h of x, y. OK? So now we're ready to fill in our um, formula, our integral. Notice that we have x times y times z, but instead of z, we have 6 minus 2x minus 3y. And then um, I took the derivatives with res of h with respect to x, got negative 2, and with respect to y, got negative 3. And so those derivatives are squared under the square root, and there's the one in the front. And then d is the um, shadow of s in the xy plane. There, there it is. And so uh, for our limits of integration, we need y to go from 0 up to the line. And then x will go from 0 to 3. And so we need an equation of a line. And to do that, what we do is we let um, z equal 0, because we're on the xy plane, z is 0, and then solve for y. And that's our line equation. And y, like I said, goes from 0 up to that line. So then we simplify the uh, square root function and get uh, square root of 14. But hold that out front. And then I multiplied out the x, y times the 6 minus 2x minus 3y. Now I'm ready to integrate with respect to y. So we do that, integrate with respect to y. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 2 minus 2 thirds x. Ooh, that's a little bit annoying. So then I substitute 2 minus 2 thirds x for all the y's. Oy vey. And um, I don't want to bore you with all the algebra, but yeah, I multiplied that all out very carefully. And look, it simplified very nicely. So then we integrate with respect to x. There you go. <laughs> and evaluate from 0 to 3. And I did not show the algebra, I mean the arithmetic. But there it is. I did it on scratch paper. Number 4. Evaluate the surface integral. Same thing again, except this time the function is z squared, and s is the part of the cone 
c equals square root of x squared plus y squared inside the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 4. So again, my first step is to sketch it. And there's the cone, the surface, the blue surface of the cone. Notice that it starts at 0 on the z and goes up to 2 for z. So those are going to be your um, limits there. And then you, the, the shadow, d, is a circle with radius 2. OK? There's our formula. And so um, z squared is is our uh, function. So that's just going to be x squared plus y squared. And then the derivatives, uh, z is your h function. Uh, so when you take the derivative of z with respect to x, it's a little messy. And the derivative of z with respect to y, and it's a little messy. But um, don't worry, algebra to the rescue. Those are squared under the square root along with the 1. Alrighty, so let's simplify that. And let's put in our limits. X is going to go across the circle from negative 2 to 2, and then the inside limits for Y are going across the circle, but they have to be um, variable to take care of the circle. And then simplifying uh, what's under the square root, oh, it's looking pretty good, because when we add those two fractions together, that's going to be really nice. That's just going to be x squared plus y squared over x squared plus y squared, which is just 1. So our square root is going to be square root of 1 plus 1. Cool. All right, so we've got the square root of 2 that comes out front. And then <clears throat> since everything is uh, the same value, everything's squared, so it's the same value in every quadrant, instead of going all the way across the circle, I'm just going to do the one quadrant and then multiply by 4, because that'll make my calculation easier. You have to be careful about that. you got to make sure that it's going to be exact, that the integrand is going to have the same value in every single quadrant in order to do that. So don't overuse that technique. So we uh, integrate with respect to y and evaluate from 0 to the square root of 4 minus x squared. Oh boy. Mm, not very pretty. So we could split that into two integrals, uh, simplify it, maybe use parts or trig sub. Eh, I don't think so. Let's use our calculator. And so it's kind of silly to have the square root of 2 in there and then an, an approximation in a decimal form. So I divided by, well, it looked familiar. So I divided by pi to make sure, and sure enough, that decimal is actually 2 pi. Cool. So then we get an exact answer after all, 8 pi root 2. Yay! Oh, you know what? I just had an idea. Anytime we see x squared plus y squared, we should be thinking polar. Duh! See, we, we have uh, everything circular here. So instead of this horrible integral, I should set it up with respect to r and theta. Um, r goes from 0 to 2. Theta goes all the way around the circle from 0 to 2 pi. We still have our square root of 2, which I can bring out front. And then um, dy dx becomes r dr d theta. Don't forget that extra r. And look how easy this is. We have r cubed in the integrand. Integrate with respect to r and evaluate from 0 to 2. And then um, that's 4. And so then we integrate with respect to theta and get theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi. And we get the exact answer with very little difficulty at all. Duh. OK, moving on. Number 14, evaluate. Ah, it's flux. Given that n is the upward pointing unit normal vector to the surface s, f is x, comma y, comma z, and s is the first octant portion of the plane to x plus 2y plus z equals 3. OK, well, here's a picture of it. And here's our handy-dandy computational formula. So that's going to be easy. We can fill that in very easily. Uh, now, just to, just to uh, as a precaution, I'm going to solve for z. We want to make sure we get the signs and everything correct. OK, so when I, when I do the partial derivative of z with respect to x and y, I'm going to need uh, to solve for z first. OK, let's fill it in. Negative p is negative x. 
and then the derivative with respect to x of z is negative 2. And then we have minus q, which is y, times the partial of z with respect to y, which is negative 2 also, plus r, which is z. Okay, now we can't have z in there. And we also need limits of integration. So again, you're going to have to solve for um, that line in the uh, xy plane because uh, y is going to go from 0 to that line. And to do that, you just put uh, 0 in for z and solve for y. I didn't show that, but you can do that. So there's our limits of integration. And then we replace z with 3 minus 2x minus 2y. And the 2x's cancel. Woohoo! Oh, looky here. And the two y's cancel. Boy, it doesn't get much easier than this. So now we just have 3 dy dx, integrate with respect to y, and evaluate from 0 to 3 halves minus x. And then integrate with respect to x. Oh, I didn't show that, did I? But there you go. I guess I ran out of room. You can do that. There's our answer, 27 eighths. Number 22. Calculate the outward flux of the vector field f equal 2x2y two comma 3 across the surface which is the boundary of the solid paraboloid bounded by the xy plane and z equal 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Paraboloid. Did I say that right? Okay, so here's our picture of the paraboloid. The uh, shadow on the xy plane is a circle. Um, that would be when z equals 0, so we've got um, 4 minus x squared minus y squared. So again, the radius is 2. They like that radius of 2, don't they? Here's our handy-dandy formula. Again, it's outward or upward, same thing. So here we have two surfaces, the top surface and the bottom surface, because it's the um, bounded by two things, the xy plane and the paraboloid. So they're talking about both surfaces here. So let's do the top surface first. That'll be the harder one. And so we um, use z to get our uh, derivatives. Partial with respect to x is negative 2x. Partial with respect to z is negative 2y. And then we multiply those by uh, p, q, and r from the f uh, formula. Okay, are we good to go? And so I'm simplifying that. And then I think I want to use polar again, don't we? Yeah. So we got 4r squared plus 3. r goes from 0 to 2. Theta goes all the way around again. 0 to 2 pi. And dx dy becomes r dr d theta. Gee, I wish I had a dollar for every time a student forgot that extra r. I'd be a rich woman. OK, so we integrate with respect to r. Evaluate. Well, I simplified first, excuse me. I uh, distributed the r and then integrated with respect to r and uh, evaluate from 0 to 2. And then integrate with respect to theta, 22 times theta, evaluated to 2 pi. So we have 44 pi. So that's the top surface. Now we got to do the bottom, and then we're going to add them together. Flux through the bottom. Well, the bottom is just a circle. And so n pointing outward, notice this time n is pointing outward, but that's going to be negative k, okay? So in this case, uh, s equals d, and because it's flat, ds equals da, and n is uh, negative k, 0, 0, negative 1. And fx and fy are both 0 because, well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? So there's f uh, that we had on the other page to remind you. And here's our handy dandy formula. And notice this time the signs are switched because it's pointing downward. Outward is now downward for that part. And it's going to be easier actually just to go ahead and use the original integral f dot n. So we dot those together and we get negative 3. And then again I'm going to switch to polar integrate with respect to r and evaluate it from 0 to 2, integrate with respect to theta and evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so now we've got to add that flux, which is negative, to the flux from the other page, from the other part of the surface, the top part. 
And so our final answer is 44 pi plus negative 12 pi, 32 pi. Number 24, calculate the outward flux of the vector field f equal x squared comma 2y squared comma 3z squared across the surface which is the boundary of the solid paraboloid bounded by the cone mm, and the plane z equal 3. Okie dokie, here's my picture, there's the cone cut off at z equal 3 and then the um, shadow in the xy plane has a radius of 3 this time obviously because uh, 3 equals square root of x squared plus y squared so 9 would be equal to x squared plus y squared and um, we're talking about outward so that's up but then when we do when we do the top it's up but when we do the bottom of the cone the cone part that's going to be down hmm. okay so here's our handy dandy formula and for the top, we're going to look at the top, n is just a 0, 0, 1. And so uh, when we dot that with f, or when we fill in the formula, either way you look at it, um, we just get 3z squared. But at the top, z is always 3, right? So z is always 3 for just the top surface. We're not doing a cone yet. And so um, we can integrate 27 and switch again then to um, polar form. And that's pretty easy. I didn't show the work, but there's the answer, 243 pi. So that's the easy part. Did the easy part this time first. All right, now let's do the hard part. And we have to switch the signs because the uh, outward uh, normal is pointing down. So unfortunately, we have to... Uh, calculate the um, derivatives, which is a bit messy. Notice the twos cancel because we take one half the square root thing to the negative one half and then we're multiplying by 2x or 2y, so the twos cancel. And then uh, um, p, q, and r are x squared, 2y squared, and 3z squared. Hmm. Not very pretty, but let's continue. Here's what we've got. And so the next step is to replace z squared with x squared plus y squared on the cone surface. That's what z, z squared equals. Ooh, not very pretty. So again, we change to um, polar. Uh, it's not as pretty as it used to be because we have to substitute for x our cosine theta. So we end up with that cubed in the first term, and then we replace y with r sine theta, and notice that all gets cubed, because we've got y squared times y, which is y, y cubed. And then, thankfully, x squared plus y squared is just r squared, and then, of course, dx dy is r dr d theta. Take a deep breath, take a deep breath. Okay, so we can divide out an r. Um, well, rather, we're canceling the r uh, under the fraction. Or I guess what I really should be saying is we're distributing the r on the on the right. And so that gets rid of the r underneath um, all that stuff. And then we have 3r squared times r. So that looks a little better, huh? So we um, integrate with respect to r and leave our cosine cubed and our sine cubed alone. Evaluated from 0 to 3. So far, so good. So putting in the 3, here's what we get. Now what? <laughs> I think I'll cop out and use the calculator. Now we could, you know, use uh, trig identities and parts and all kinds, or u sub and all kinds of stuff, but I'm going to cop out and use the calculator. And here's what I got. But then when I divided by pi, woohoo, it came out nicely. So I got an exact answer. Now, flow out to the top plus flow out through the bottom of the cone um, is the sum of those two answers, 243 pi from the first calculation and then adding this negative. And so our final answer is 243 pi over 2.
Okay, let's review the integrals we're actually using here. Here's the one for surface integral with a function given. And remember that if the function is 1, what are we doing? Well, what this integral computes depends upon f of x, y, z. If f of x, y, z is 1, we get the surface area. If f of x, y, z is density, we get the mass of a thin lamina. And if f is um, vector f dot um, unit normal vector n, we get flux. Now there's a uh, easy way to compute flux. We have our handy dandy formula for um, upward pointing n, and then the second one's for downward pointing n. And all the other integrals in this lesson were preliminary to the derivation of these two computational forms and are rarely needed. Bye-bye.